Oh my goodness. A Fed economist bemoans criminally oppressive social order. But financial oppression has been around for a long time since the fiat money started. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies. And frankly, you've been having a strategy implemented on you since the day you were born, whether you realize it or not. So it is critically important for you to have your own strategy. But now let's get back to that little Fed economist who says that criminally oppressive social order, and he's so upset about it. And what's he talking about? Well, a senior Fed Reserve economist has slammed the profession for relying on propositions that everybody knows to be true, but that are actually errant nonsense. So it's the assumptions, because I don't know how many Fed economists actually live in the real world, the day-to-day -day world, but they can make all of these assumptions and then have them actually based on nothing. It is just a theory. He noted that it was a source of concern if dubious, but widely held theories led to consequential policy decisions. Now let's think about this because what have we been inside of but a big, huge Federal Reserve or Central Bank experiment? And they don't know if it's going to work or not. <laughs> QE, they don't know if it's going to work or not. Well, they actually know that it doesn't work and there's been studies out there now. But when they first started it, they had no clue whether or not it would actually perform the way that they wanted it to perform. And it hasn't. But they keep doing it. And then they've got to figure out something else for the unintended consequence, read reverse repos that we've been talking about as just some of the examples where the K-shape recovery or lots of other things because it's based upon their theories that when you get into the real world, they simply don't work. How about negative rates? We're going to talk more about that though. Okay. Concern if dubious but widely held theories led to consequential policy decisions, which they do because they're the ones that are driving this bus. But more importantly, I leave aside the deeper concern that the primary role of mainstream economics in our society is to provide an apologetics for a criminally oppressive, unsustainable, and unjust social order. And what he's really talking about is the central banks choosing those that win and those that lose, because frankly, it's a big club and we're not in it. Okay, it's that simple. But the reality also is, is that it is about to get a whole lot worse. We're seeing prices explode. We're seeing growth implode. But again, this is not something that is frankly new. It's something that has really been around since the government handed over or installed the Federal Reserve into our system. And it is about perception management, getting you to move forward, getting you to believe things that really are not true. And hey, the IMF even discussed it. So throughout history, the ratio of debt to gross domestic product has been reduced in a variety of ways. So it's not about changing behavior. It is about changing the way they manipulate or account for that behavior and or quite frankly. So how, how are these tools being used in the past and currently? Let's look at that. Well, if they can get the economy to grow, then that debt to GDP is smaller and they can keep growing debt because the intention is never to pay off that debt. If they pay off the debt, then that reduces the money supply. The intention is to ever 
constantly expand it. Taxing and spending or austerity. Well, you know, there are limitations. We're all about to see an increase in taxes. So they raise the taxes or they reduce the taxes based upon what they want to have happen. As we saw back in 2017, when corporations got this huge tax break, what we were told is that this would increase spending by those corporations and generate greater revenues, more jobs, et cetera, and it didn't. All of all that tax break really did primarily is enable stock buybacks and also dividends. So that money was brought in and the, of the company and then sent right out. Then you get into problems and they have to be bailed out. But also they tested austerity, particularly in Greece is probably a pretty good example of that. And that doesn't really work either. Default or restructuring of private and or public debt. Well, quite frankly, we're about to see quite a bit of that coming in our near future. Lowering interest rates and adding all of this easy money and liquidity into the system is what has pushed that into our future and that we didn't really experience it because they were bailed out by the Federal Reserve. Sudden surprise! <laughs> Bursts of inflation. You have to understand this is how you reduce the debt to GDP. I mean, that, that's what this is in the IMF documents. Did we, have we, did we not just and are we not just also experiencing surprise bursts in inflation? They couldn't hit their 2% target, yet we were warned when they still couldn't hit their 2% target, that they were going to change how they accounted for it so that they would allow that inflation to run hot. They couldn't get it up to 2% in 10 years, but now all of a sudden, what do we have? A sudden surprise burst of inflation, which we were initially told was transitory, but what we're subsequently being told is maybe a little stickier than they thought, but it'll still calm down to that 2% level. We'll see where the prices end up there. But I mean, it's in the playbook, people. It's in the playbook. Financial repression, where governments use, use uh, funds that would otherwise go to other borrowers. So pushing down interest rates, which does push people out on the risk spectrum, but then also creating, which we're going to talk about in a minute, a captive market. Because the reality is, is that debt reductions, or, and it's not really debt reductions as much as it is the appearance of debt reductions, often combine more than one of these avenues. You think? They're trying all of them. Don't, doesn't that really look pretty familiar to what we've been experiencing now? Now, this was back in 2011 was when they put out this piece. Financial repression has recently re-emerged along with large increases in public debts in advanced economies. And I would argue that apparently they don't really read all of their work because um, we've been in a period of financial repression for a very long time, as their data will show us. Okay, negative real rates are a tool of financial repression. And um, negative real rates take into account the nominal rate, right? So the bond has a coupon of say, you know, 2% or 5% or whatever that coupon is, but then inflation is higher than that. So the real rate of a turn is substantially less. And in here, they give us this little table. So these different colors are representative of the years, not that it hasn't been used. So it was used before between 1945. Okay, let's just cut to the chase here. It's been used since 1945. And I dare say even before that, because the whole system back in the 1920s was um, designed for a kickoff. But now we're well kicked off. So they've been using this in the three and a half decades following World War II and the three years since the global crisis. Remember, this is 2011. 
real rates as exemplified by those on treasury bills from advanced economies were on average negative. So I pulled up a more current graph as you can see here and um, look at this, pretty negative, pretty darn negative because here's zero. So what they're really telling you here and what they're actually showing is that, um, you know, that inflation has and will continue to be above the yields that you get on what we're told is the safest investment that you can make, meaning that you lock in a loss. Just as a little reminder, okay? These are interest rates, and this is important because interest rates have been spiking. So these are interest rates. This is the principal value of the bond. This is when you issue the bond. So anything longer than that, that's longer term, shorter, 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 and you know, overnight rates, right? And what happens? When interest rates go down, the principal value of the bond goes up. But if inflation then is even higher than the interest that you are actually paying, if you hold this bond to maturity, you, even though nominally it may look the same, $1,000 and $1,000, but remember your nominal confusion. That thousand dollars, the way that you could, what you could buy with that 20 years ago, 10 years ago, a year ago, and what you can buy with it today, vastly different. And that my friends is by design. They even talk about it because it is a way to reduce the debt to GDP level without anybody knowing. It's really an invisible tax and we're gonna talk more about that in just a second as well. Advanced economies have been using it on a perpetual basis. And what happens in these times is that private money retreats, right? So the private banks, and we know after the financial crisis, you know, a lot of the banks got out of uh, lending, some different lending, and then the shadow banks went in. So private money retreats, and then the government goes in and picks up that slack. And where have we seen that? These are the treasury bonds held by the Fed, okay? And frankly, it started in 2002, in fact, and we can see how that's been escalating through this, through 2008 and the most current crisis. And by the way, this is when they just held the balance sheet steady since they're talking about tapering or buying a little bit less. Yeah, we'll see how that works. I don't think they're gonna be able to get away with it for very long, but I, I could be wrong. I mean, that's not something that's within my control. And then these are the mortgage-backed securities to support the real estate market because on a global basis, and in the US, you know, real estate or businesses around real estate represent roughly 30% of the GDP. Can they really afford to have another housing crisis like we did back in, you know, 2008? I don't think so, but we're gonna see what happens if the Fed really does stop or reduce supporting those markets. Though we have been warned, it will be glacially slow. So what are they going to do from 120 billion? They're going to do 119 billion. I mean, I don't know, but they're doing it in the face of lower interest rates. And I know interest rates have been spiking just recently. We've got a very interesting test that is going on because what this really is, is a financial repression tax, but it's completely invisible. Inflation tax is a little more visible, but it is a way for the government and the central banks to tax you without you realizing that that's what's happening. And that taxes regulations, and we can see how those regulations have been changing, plus the almost invisible inflation tax that pushes you into other products. And we've talked so much about how savers are being forced to go out on their risk spectrum. 
but financial oppression is most successful in liquidating debts when accompanied by a steady dose of inflation. And just so you know, those highlights are mine. They were all one color, uh, you know, in the, in the quote. But, and like inflation alone, it only works with debt denominated in domestic currency. So in other words, they, each country will, will use financial repression, but that only works in the U.S. on U.S. dollar denominated bonds. What's particularly interesting to me when we're looking at this is how many dollar denominated bonds are issued in say, uh, you know, China or other emerging markets and how repressing it here impacts them there. I don't know. I'll have to think about that one a little bit more, but this is, it's such a, 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 a mishmash of policies, et cetera, from country to country that when this thing explodes, it really isn't going to matter where it starts. It's going to ripple through the global economy. That's why it's a global issue because what financial repression all also does with that, because that's what inflation does is it destroys your purchasing power. doesn't matter how many dollars you have. It matters what you can do with it, what you can buy with it. And we know, I mean, look at the pricing out there. If you have to put that extra money in a tank of gas, and for some people that are marginal, if they have to put that money in a tank of gas or on the, on the table, you know, it's going to be a very hard choice. Or on the table or meds, it's going to be a hard choice. So who does it hurt? It hurts the people at the bottom of the spectrum. But there are lots of examples how they eliminate debt by using this method, regulations plus inflation. So the financial repression tax. Financial repression can wipe out large quantities of government debt in what has been called the liquidation effect. This has an effect equivalent to increasing government revenues so it doesn't actually increase them, but it makes it look like it increases government revenues and is used by both emerging and advanced economies going all the way back. Here's Argentina, Australia, Belgium, in England, India, Ireland, Italy, South Africa, Sweden, United Kingdom, United States. They, everybody is using it. And who's the, who at the end is the one that pays for this? It's the public. It's absolutely. And in my opinion, what we're also dealing with here is taxation without representation. I mean, I can't even tell you that those in Congress understand this. I'm pretty sure Jerome Powell understands this. And equally, I would say Janet Yellen understands this. But do I think that most politicians understand this? Heck no, I don't, nor is it much in their control. This is more in central bank control and treasury control because they're the ones that set up the regulations. Now, I'm just going to give you some examples because what they've really done is they've created captive markets and not just in government bonds. I mean, we've been taught that there's no other pool of investments other than the fiat money products, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, all of that crap. Frankly, that is not true. But let's look at just talking about government bonds for a minute. Governments in advanced economies have taken many steps to, in recent years to create or grow demand for public debt or to directly access private savings. They don't really want you to understand what they're doing, but you know, I, I picked this, not only was this part of the report from the IMF, but also because we always think that that's over here and it doesn't impact us. And look at these advanced economies, France, 2010, conversion of a pension reserve fund to a captive buyer of French official debt. In other words, they're taking the government pension plan and they're buying government bonds with it. That is a captive audience. Now in Ireland, not only did they use the national pension reserve to recapitalize banks, mind you, but they also 
proposed funding a jobs program through a 0.5% levy or tax on private pension funds. So getting the government funds weren't enough that go into your pension. So we all know that we have a retirement crisis that is already unfolding. This just makes it a whole lot worse. And Japan, well, you know, they've been violators for a very long time. But in 2010, they reversed privatization of Japan Post and an increase in deposit ceiling. And what all that garbage means, first of all, the Japan Post is the world's largest financial conglomerate. So people in Japan think of it just like, you know, we would think of a bank and we're going to put our money, deposit our money in and save it. Um, so this was a private enterprise. So they, they wanted the money, so they turned it into a private enterprise. And now they have reversed it, taken all of that money that's in those deposits back into the government, which means that they now have a captive market, all those deposits to buy government bonds. I think that's just a great idea, and I hope you know I'm being completely facetious. Uh, let's see. It also increased the capacity of, of captive customers uh, to increase how much they can deposit. So they're not, putting, they're not putting a cap on that. So they create all of this new money, give it to the population, puts it in the bank, that buys government bonds. I mean, it creates this what's called a righteous doom loop that we saw back in 2013, 14, 15 in the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, but this we're going to see well into the future as well. Portugal, 2010, transfer of the previously privatized Portugal Telecom. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, right? Uh, privatized Portugal Telecom pension scheme, their words, not mine, but I'd agree, back to the government, giving them access to all the money that was in there. Interest rate ceilings on deposit in Spain, United Kingdom, increase in required holdings of government bonds, you know, Royal Mail privatization. I mean, and then here's a whole laundry list since 2008. Now, I want you to keep in mind that this little list, since this piece was produced by the IMF in 2011, is only a three-year time period. So what do you think we have coming up in our future? Anything like that again? Oh, I think so. Because financial repression with its dual aims of keeping interest rates low and creating or maintaining captive domestic audiences will continue to find renewed favor and the measures and developments we have described and discussed are likely to be only the tip of a very large iceberg. You and I have a choice as to whether we stay on that iceberg and are swallowed up when the whole thing topples or we make a choice to get off that iceberg, become our own central bank and protect our wealth and our future. And that's what we need to do and not with contracts. But what you're looking at here is the correlation between spot gold fixing price spot goal is just a contract, and government inflation indexed bonds. And seems to me to be just a huge correlation between the spot gold and the interest rates. But additionally, remember, according to the Bank for International Settlements, gold is proven to be an inflation hedge. And we have definitely entered, you know, I mean, I told you before that I really, I'm sorry to say, but I do think that we've entered the period of hyperinflation. I don't have all technical signals confirming that yet, but I see what's happening and it feels like it in my gut. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. It's coming sooner or later. And, you know, obviously central banks have long manipulated the price of gold. Because gold as the primary currency metal, mm -hmm. we know a rising gold price is an indication of a failing fiat currency. And if you actually knew that the fiat currency was failing, you would make different choices just like I have. Just like I have. 
So here is Alan Greenspan, who my mom used to love, and she used to say to me all the time, but Lynn, don't you think that Alan Greenspan's smarter than you? Don't you think he's smarter? And I would say to her, well, mom, I really hope that he is smarter than me because he certainly has a whole lot more power than I do. But if he really is, I mean, we got some problems here because he says, this is a quote from the 1993 FOMC meeting minutes when he was Fed chair. If we are dealing with psychology, then the thermometers one uses to measure it have an effect. What would happen if the Treasury sold a little gold in this market? Oh, there's an interesting question here. Because if the gold price broke in that context, the thermometer would not be just a measuring tool. It would basically affect the underlying psychology. Let the manipulation ramp up. Because really, financial repression is a perception management tool. And when you look at the central banks, and let's presume for a moment that we're getting accurate information from the central banks and what they've done with their gold since, well, this goes back to 1971. And my goodness, where's 19? Oh, there's 1993. So you can see when Alan May Greenspan made that statement, you can see how they manipulated the price of gold until obviously the financial crisis hit. And once the financial crisis hit, well, then they started becoming net gold buyers. And in fact, have been buying, as you can see, going back to 1971, when we fully came off the gold standard, we have been buying more gold than ever. Central banks have been. I have been, I hope you have been too. But who knows more about money and how they're debasing and destroying the system than central banks? They're buying gold. I'm buying gold and silver as well. And that's what I think you should be doing and sooner than later. Do not be fooled by what's going on. And as you know, here at ITM Trading, we use the Wealth Shield strategy, and its foundations are gold and silver. But you know, you need more than that. You need food, water, energy, security, as well as that barterability, wealth preservation, and community is a huge key. It's probably, I mean, food is the biggest issue for people as we go through the hyperinflationary depression that is not too far in our future. But if we can come together in community and help each other, then, you know, that's, that's everything really. And shelter, of course, these are things that we're going to need. So if you want to be the first to get notified, when I do urgent videos on the economy and the global reset, just make sure to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell icon. We're getting new information constantly and sometimes many times during the day. And when something is that important and affects you, I will absolutely come on air and let you know about it. So just hit that bell and we'll let you know when we go live. But please, it is time to cover your assets. So until next time, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.